Uh, so thank you for coming uh, for our very special art event today. I want to take a moment and just tell you where you are and who we are. You are at the Philosophical Research Society, founded in 1934 by a scholar, teacher, lecturer named Manly Palmer Hall, a Canadian who moved here uh, and was acquainted with Rosicrucianism through his grandmother and then became interested in everything, everything, from Kabbalah to Buddhist psychology to modern psychology to literature, uh, everything. Uh, he began lecturing uh, in 1921 in Los Angeles and was uh, a lot going on in Los Angeles in 19, early 20th century and g got a following and then ended up lecturing all over the world and ended up founding this society in 1934 and uh, on the principles of really seekers of wisdom and so we still follow his mission, which is to provide resources for seekers on whatever path they're on. And we're on many different paths. And I think this was the genius of our founder, is that he didn't, he didn't limit our resources to just one path, although that would have been fine. So when you go into our library, if you come back, uh, I hope you will, You'll see everything from mythology to astrology to alchemy to Kabbalah to modern philosophy um, and indigenous uh, studies, all kinds of things. Uh, and we continue that tradition um, here. So f just one little commercial, if you don't mind. Uh, I'm doing a series right now called Los Angeles Stories. Did I say who I was? <laughs> Did I say that? I'm, I'm Greg. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. I'm the president. I'm the president, so I'm not just some guy who wandered onto the stage. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm the president, and I give lectures every Tuesday night. Um, and right now we're doing a series called Los Angeles Stories, um, interpreting the city of angels. So last week we talked about Aldous Huxley's vision of Los Angeles, and this Tuesday is going to be James M. Cain's vision of Los Angeles, right? So double indemnity and Mildred Pierce and the postman always rings twice that vision of Los Angeles. Um, we have lots of other things, including a gallery in the back. Uh, Genia has overflowed our capacity, which is wonderful. And so she has paintings in the back as well as in here. And if you want to know what our founder thought about art, I can tell you pretty clearly. He said this, all good art is religious art because it impels us to appreciate and to admire. And these are the natural foundations of veneration. It is indeed better to understand than to worship, to appreciate than to accept, and to be at peace rather than to strive after the great abstractions of the spirit. An artist can make great things simple. The art lover, lover makes simple things great. And I'm, it's my pleasure to introduce to you our artist for this evening, this afternoon, Genia Gershman. Uh, if I were to read all her accomplishments and credentials to you, there wouldn't be time to talk. So let me uh, truncate this a little bit. This, a little bit. She was a precocious child, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, born in Moscow and held her first solo exhibition in St. Petersburg at 14, which I think many of us have probably done that, haven't we? <laughs> um, the youngest student to be admitted to the Otis Art Institute. She graduated with honors and later received her MFA uh, from the Art Center College of Design. The Grammy Music Cares Foundation selected Genia to create portraits of Springsteen and Dylan. That's Bruce and Bob. Surely you know that. Uh, in 2000, Gershman was a recipient of the Alex Award in Visual Arts from the National Alliance for Excellence, Honored Scholar and Artist Programs. Uh, she's also a scholar, uh, independent scholar and museum educator at the Getty and other places. We came to know her through her project All, Aesthetics of Western Esotericism. 
and uh, that's a nonprofit foundation for arts and education, and it's going really well from what I hear. Um, uh, published, scho published scholar in art journals, etc. Uh, I want to introduce Dr. Pintas Giller, brought up in Cocoa Beach, Florida. He was ordained at Yeshiva University and received his doctorate at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. Rabbi Giller has written extensively on Judaism and his field of expertise, which is Jewish mysticism, or as you probably know, Kabbalah. He's written four books, and forgive, I have a little Greek and less Hebrew, forgive my pronunciation. Um, let's see, The Enlightened Will Shine, Symbolism and Theurgy in the Later Strata of the Zohar. Reading the Zohar, Shalom Sharabi and the Kabbalists of Beit El, a guide for the perplexed, Kabbalah, a guide for the perplexed, and edited Ber Moshe Ahal Torah, a Bible commentary by his great great grandfather. That's very cool. Jack Repberg here is an art dealer, curator, and consultant with over 40 years' experience. He established the Jack Rutberg School of uh, Fine Arts in Los Angeles. Not a school, is it? <laughs> Not yet. Jack Rutberg Fine Arts in Los Angeles in 1979, dealing in modern and contemporary art and representing a wide range of important American and European artists. He's lectured extensively on modern and contemporary art at numerous museums, colleges, universities, symposia, etc. Mr. Rutberg has curated exhibitions by gallery represented artists, uh, several, and um, among numerous distinctions, Mr. Rutberg was the recipient of the LA Art Corps Fifth Annual Award for Outstanding Contribution in the Arts and the Hollywood Arts Council Charlie Award. So we have a distinguished panel, and uh, by the way, we also have a catalog for the show that's available in the bookstore. Uh, you might even get it signed. Please welcome our distinguished panel. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. Um, really, on a Sunday early afternoon to come out to Las Feliz to talk about Kabbalah and art. You're so dedicated. I'm very grateful to you. And I'm amazed the flanking to my right and to my left, such distinguished and amazing people that I respect. Um, and I hope that you will see why in just a moment as they speak, really incredible thoughts. I wanted to take us back to the space, to the art, and start by mentioning what I do. And I do portraits. And what is a portrait? I'm kind of a rebel and I ask a lot of questions. So one day I said, I've been painting portraits since I was 10 years old. What is it? So I looked it up. Does anybody know the etymology, what portrait comes from? I didn't. So I went to online, and it comes from the Latin word protrajo. And protrajo, if, you, if anybody speaks other Latin languages like French, port, portrait, is a door. It's to bring forth from one place to another to transport. In Renaissance, often the paintings or the portraits were thought of as windows or as doors. So it's curious as we sit in this room and we see the canvases, you can think of them as ports or portrajo, a door that connects us. What, what does it connect us to? So if we go back to that original Latin root of protrajo, it's to drag to pull, to bring forth out of something to something else. And what is that? That is time. And if we think about another idea, where did painting start? It was the Romans that asked a lot of questions, perhaps like I like, I like to ask a lot of questions. And they also wanted to answer them. And they had an answer for everything. And of course, they said that they invented portraits. And, uh, the story was, does anybody remember the story? This, this might sound familiar. It, of course, was very much a Hollywood story. There had to be the most gorgeous woman who ever lived and the most gorgeous man who ever lived. And of course, they were terribly in love and it was very rated R if you saw this film. And they're sitting in the cave, exhausted from their lovemaking. 
And then the woman is crying. And why is she crying? Because she knows that her beloved will leave, he will go to war. He has a duty to go and defend his country, his city, and most likely she will never see him again. So what is looming behind the story is this idea of separation and death. So while she's crying and is sitting in, the, in this dark environment of the cave, she has a little candle and she glances at him. She glances at his beauty, trying to behold it. And she notices that there's a shadow that's projecting onto the wall. And in her grief, she just picks up a little charcoal from the floor, a little or a little chalk, something, a sediment from this rock, right? And she traces his shadow. And that is how the first portrait is born from this idea of conquering death, from holding on, from this door that brings forth from the past to the, to the present to the future, something that will survive. And likewise, to your side, there are paintings of my daughter and my grandmother. My grandmother, Baba, this is what we call a grandmother in Russian, and she was such a Baba, she was a grandmother to everybody, uh, really a, an amazing matriarch. She's not here anymore, and yet these paintings are here. So I wanted to start with that, and then bring you to the title of the exhibition, which is Graven Image. And it is inspired by one of the oldest texts, um, Jewish mystical text, called Sefer Yitzra. And there's a little quote that I'm gonna let uh, Pinhas read, but before I turn you over, I perhaps will speak a little bit of my personal inspiration, but I wanted to get a little bit more of a historical background. And if you weren't reading Sefer Yitzhar last night, Pinhas is here to tell you a bit about it and bring you up to speed on its history and its meaning. But I wanted to say how I met Pinhas. A few years ago, I became incredibly interested in uh, Jewish mysticism. And it wasn't because I was Jewish, and it wasn't because I was religious, it was because I was interested in the art, and I noticed that a lot of Renaissance artists were using actually Hebrew and coding messages in their artworks. Artists like Durer, artists even later like Rembrandt. And I couldn't read anything, I didn't read Hebrew, and, and even if I did, I didn't know what it is that they were referring. So I wanted to meet the most amazing Kabbalist specialist in Los Angeles. And that is how I got to Pinhas. He teaches at American Jewish University. And I just want to tell you a little anecdote, perhaps he doesn't even know this, how I first met him. I was very intimidated. Um, these were rabbinical uh, students in his class, and he allowed me by email to come and audit. And I found his office, and I saw him, and you see how he's, he looks very intimidating, so scholarly. And he had a, you know, these guys in black, and you know, and they were all speaking very fast. And he was frantically doing something. He said, "We have more people than we thought in the class, and we need a larger room. We can't meet in my office." And there was another man who worked at American Jewish University who came by, and he heard that and said, "I thought you guys were Kabbalists, and you can expand the space." <laughs> so I was absolutely terrified. What's going to happen next? So with that, I turn you to Pinhas. <laughs> OK, well, first of all, at a certain point this afternoon, I have a reading that I just want to excerpt. So if somebody could take this, take this stack of readings from me and pass it down to maybe, oh, thank you, Kelly. Oh, maybe give it to you know, every two people or something like that and in case we get to that. Um, I wanted to speak a little bit about the quote from Sefer Yitzira. And <clears throat> the real tension in the quote is a theme that comes from antiquity about the nature of creation. It's already a premise in Jewish, in Jewish thought that God spoke and created something from nothing. Right? It wasn't like platonic pre-existent forms and matter. It was something from nothing. God spoke and it was created. Well, what did God speak? Well, what language does God speak? Obviously, God speaks Hebrew. That's the first thing, because that's you know, the primordial language, according to this tradition. And um, how then does God create the world? Well, through the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, arranged linguistically, if you know something about linguistics, with bilabials and percussives and glottals and those families of, of, of expression, explosives, um, uh, those are the various powers, the way that they're arranged, as well as 
10 factors, 10 emanations, and they could be 10 numbers. They could be the 10 aspects of the, uh, uh, the 10 numbers of the base 10 integer system, but it's 10 powers. And eventually these powers got explained to be sort of 10 elements and even in an embodied form sort of like chakras, but that will come later. Now the main thing to note here is engraving is the metaphor, right? So whether, when one engraves, there's an element of dimension in the engraving when you have sort of sealing wax, which is another expression of the metaphor. You seal the wax and there's a, you take away the seal and there's an impression made by the seal, but the, the, the impression of the seal is still there in the formal wax. If you engrave something, literally, uh, like etching or that kind of thing, there's an impression of your movement, it's spatial. And that kind of spatial that in the created world, which is made out of dull matter, is in fact feels the shapes, the touch, the hand of the creator by virtue of the creator's absence. It's the sort of the reverse, the reverse negative of it. And that's the quality we have in the, in the quote. Um, uh, which really, and, and also the idea of snow in the Middle East, snow, they really didn't know where snow came from. So they believed, sort of like Superman with the Fortress of Solitude, that there was a great treasury of snow somewhere from which all Earth was created. It's somewhere in the primordial north. But that's really the main issue here. The main issue is how does one give spatial form when you're really leaving the relief of your action. And that's the metaphor of the engraving. I think I've talked enough. So yeah, what, the, um, yeah. the two things that I'd like to jump into, uh, straight into the engraving. So the technique that I'm using for these paintings is not a brush. It's actually an engraving tool. So I'm moving the paint with what seems almost like a tool, like a, a palette knife, but it has a serrated end. It's actually a sculptural tool. Um, so here I show you one of the paintings in the exhibition in the smaller gallery, and a detail that shows you the material removed and shifted around and dug into. So if we think about also the root of the word engrave, the word grave is in the root of that word. And earth, grave, earth, placing into the grave is returning to. So we have, again, this cycle of life and death, returning to the earth, because originally in the Bible, uh, man are ma is made out of clay, out of earth. So this, this going back, it's not a gr kind of a grim idea. It's an idea of a re rebirth. And in the grave, something as um, Pin has alluded, something that's missing and something that's filled. That also takes us to the idea of what's visible and invisible. And I think art is one of the best metaphors for that. Um, I'd like to also jump to Jack, um, as he has some interesting ideas to talk about a larger context of history and how artists deal with this. Well, thank you for having me here. I had nothing to do today, and uh, <laughs> uh, it's great to be off the street. Um, particularly since many of you know that our, we are in transition in terms of looking for our new gallery space after 37 years in the same location. So for those of you that have had many questions asked regularly, j just know that um, we're not retiring. We continue on. Um, but I am thinking about the act of portraiture in art, the origins of portraiture, of course, uh, and, and, I, and I think that to be a contemporary artist today and do portraits is a rather brave thing um, for numbers of reasons. When we think of portraiture, we go back to the age of uh, aristocracy, the church, rulers. They were acts of vanity. They were acts of journalism um, to, to maintain an, an image even in, in Egyptian times, the sarcophagus would have these lifelike paintings on top of the coffins, many of which were ultimately removed, by the way. When you see these Egyptian paintings in museums, these were literally cut out of 
these um, coffins. They became very popular in the 19th century and exported to Europe. Uh, they were, had great popularity uh, in Europe. A bizarre kind of history. It's worth, worth learning about, which uh, um, they, uh, there would even be mummy parties where mummies were exported to France and England and they would have mummy parties where people would literally unroll a mummy and um, they would grind up the mummies and literally two use them today. <laughs> at two, yes and, 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 and use it for paint frankly they would grind up it was called mummy brown uh, I've only learned this recently by going to the Getty uh, I never even heard of mummy brown but in any case uh, you, see, you see the portrait evolving at about the time after the Renaissance when the Dutch started being attracted to common people, but they were still patrons of the aristocracy that, that, that collected these things. The single critical moment, if one can say that there is a single critical moment where portraiture changes, it's when art changes and when modern art really begins, and that's with the invention of the camera. And the artist is liberated from the responsibility of flattery, of documentation, and for the first time, artists could search inward and have an impression and, and reflect expressive ideas. I think the danger in portraiture today is that our brains see an image and we immediately conjure, we recognize it, we like it, we don't like it, but as a work of art, we kind of move past them too quickly. And I would say to you that portraits are no different than any other form of painting. Um, landscapes are portraits. Mm -hmm. Urban scenes, great urban paintings are portraits. They reflect a life that exists there or existed or passed through there. And that's really the criteria that we look to in great portraiture, that which is evocative, not merely as the facility of an artist able to render. Any ad agency has that kind of an artist, but someone who can convey um, a deeper reflection. I, 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 w I won't go on further. There's a lot I'd like to say about deeper reflections because I question a great deal of that. And these paintings are a great example of an, a kind of inward response and I think um, I'd like to investigate that further if time goes on. But uh, um, uh, Zhenya, I think you have... So many things that I want to respond to. It's so exciting. First of all, um, you mentioned you evoked the Fayum portraits, the old um, Egyptian mummy portraits, which are not Egyptian, they are um, Roman portraits in Greek style in Egyptian culture, so it's a very strange hybrid. Mm -hmm. And you did a terrible thing mentioning it because I wrote a thesis about <laughs> it. <laughs> Who knew? So we're now stuck till 3 p.m. at least. <laughs> um, they fa fascinated me so greatly because it is this hybrid between the three cultures and the the role of the artist. I, I should just mention the role of the artist. When the person would be dying, you know, they would call in a priest to do a religious ceremony to allow the person's soul to transgress into another realm, to another um, place. They would also call a doctor to make sure that it was painless and it was helpful. And they would call an artist that would be the third person called in. And as the soul is migrating, the artist would be making the portrait. And this is very different from how we would think of it in Renaissance or 19th century contemporary art. And the reason is because the Egyptians believed that the soul saw in the portrait um, a mirror. And if it recognized itself in the portrait, it would not wander back to the universe and get lost, but would go and impregnate that portrait and would live in it. And here we come to maybe the other side of uh, graven image and this forbidden taboo of, of creating images, right? Something that's almost magical and, and, and seems kind of borderline um, taboo, right? Um, and when you go see these Fayum portraits, there is a beautiful collection at the Getty. Uh, there is an eerie quality to them. You, you really feel the presence, and the presence is something I definitely look for. Uh, so maybe I'm a blasphemist. Um, 
I also want to refer to the, qu the question of landscape versus portrait. Um, I also can't believe you said that because I, I am very dissatisfied with the term portraiture because it, exactly for the reason that Jack uh, brought up, the commission portrait where you imagine somebody who is sitting with their favorite dog and their favorite object in the background, and this is not what I do. And sometimes I'd like to refer to these paintings instead of a portrait as a psychological landscape. And this is emphasized by the fact of the scale. It is my hope, a lot of people ask me, why do I paint so large? It is my hope that um, they're not TV size, they're more like a, a film size, right, screen size. And it's my hope that you lose yourself, your body disappears into them and it becomes like a landscape. With a landscape, you don't take it in at one glance. You have to collectively move your head to take it in and stitch it together in your experience. And likewise, when a portrait is on this scale, and this is the enlargement of what you see, um, this is particular portrait is of my teacher. Uh, this is a man who really changed my life. Uh, his name is Leonid Matzach, he's a great philosopher, whom I met and love, but who has never met me. <laughs> I listen to his lectures, and I listen to his lectures, and I continue listening to him daily. Um, he's a Russian philosopher. Um, uh, after he had passed away, and in order to bring him back to life, I wanted to paint this portrait. I wanted to get closer and to understand him. So what I'm painting here is not the presence, not the absence, but his words. This is maybe um, a like to Seferi Yitzra. I'm actually thinking about the words, the words that he cherished and shares with his students, the inspiration, and this is more than the image. I give you a close-up of the eyes here. Um, there is the most frustrating expression that I like to um, dispel, and that is, you probably all heard, that the eyes are the window of the soul. Okay, this comes actually from Renaissance, and it could be another day, a whole lecture about why that comes so, and it comes with the invent of perspective, and the belief that pers the vanishing point actually is re receding to the God's eye. And for that reason, we have the emphasis on the eye, the one-point perspective, and the eye being elevated over other parts of the body as a prim primordial, the most important organ of the soul. But when I make my portraits, though I have give you a, a close-up here of the eyes, I like to think about how else can you make a portrait, and where else can the soul reside? This is a painting, um, has anybody seen the small gallery, the other part of the exhibition? I hope that we can go at the end um, together or separately and look at those paintings. This is one of the paintings in the show, and this is a portrait, but here you don't have a face, you don't have the eyes, you don't have the, the features, but you have the touch. And for all of you who have loved, you know how much the touch means. Whether you loved your mother, or your child, or your lover, when you touch their skin, there's nothing like it. And there's also this idea of touching, and bringing the hands together, and feeling the energy, and the space between, the negative space between, and what you hold, again, back to visible and invisible. I was also struck when I was learning from Pinhas that the prayer, the actual bringing of the hands coming together, could be coming from a tradition of the Kabbalist trying to meditate on the 10 sephirot of the Kabbalah. And so for this, I want to jump back to Pinhas. Well, I, I actually wanted to um, skip to something um, really having to do with embodiment, and that would be on the second page of the reading that I prepared. That's the reading that begins, the prophet Elijah of blessed memory opened and said. Uh, because we have this tension, you know, in Judaism, if I asked any third grader from a reform Jewish temple uh, could I, uh, and said, does God have a body? They would say, no, God absolutely does not have a body. If you make a picture of God, that's an idol. That's, that's the wrong thing to do. I mean, this is what they teach in the Stephen Wise synagogue, I'm, you know, so it's fairly normative. And yet, if you walk through the gift shop here, there are a number of works which deal with Kabbalah, and some of them are on display. Uh, I could give two instances walking through the gift shop in the library in which there are pictures of God coming from a Kabbalistic and a Judaic perspective. Um, and they're part of a uh, uh, post-Renaissance interest in Kabbalah going over into we, the, the beginnings of what we call New Age thought and that kind of thing. And in fact, not only that, but there's sort of a lost tradition 
rather like the chakra tradition in tantrism, if you've ever worked with that in yoga or, or some other venue, um, uh, of, of different energies being centered in different parts of the body, which are part of the human body, and you can access them in the course of your body work, or you can, or they are also part of God's body, and the human body is a is a an imitation of God's body or a mirror of God's body. And there's a word for this, it's called isomorphism. And I have a, a little piece here on the second page. It talks a little bit about these stages of embodiment and powers of embodiment. So I'd like just to guide you through it. Um, the spherot, the emanations of the beginning of creation, Atsilut, are clothed in garments and they are called the body relative to the clothes that cover them. We don't know the essence of God, but we know the clothing that's on God, which are the attributes of God. The limbs are arranged as follows. Loving kindness is the right arm. Gvura, which is um, uh, heroism, restraint, or judgment, is the left arm. Harmony, glory, tiferet, is the torso. Netzach, which I would call everlastingness, they call it dominance, is the left thigh. Hod, which I would call grandeur, is the uh, right thigh. And then there's a, a sexual chakra also called yesod uh, at the genitals, and um, uh, which is the sign of the holy covenant. This refers to the point of circumcision, which is called the sign of the covenant because circumcision is merely just a sign of uh, that, that the child is in covenant with God now. Um, Malchut is the mouth of the Holy Covenant. It also could be the labia in a kind of um, uh, primordial feminine, or it's also often called the feet. Therefore, it is called the oral Torah. Above these is the head. Chokhmah, wisdom, is the right cha chamber of the brain, the seat of thought. Bina, understanding, is the left chamber of the brain. The combination of the two is high consciousness, which is called dat. These three elements, chokhmah, bina, and dat, form an, acronism, an acronym, chabad, which is, of course, an evangelical movement in Judaism now called chabad, but it stands for these three highest levels of consciousness leading to the merged consciousness at the, at the, at the top, which is really the ground of being of God. So there is, now this little passage that I read you um, is liturgical. It's in the prayer books. It's in the prayer books of the Kabbalists, which are still normative for all the Orthodox Jews who sort of follow this Kabbalistic understanding, which is a lot, and conservative and, and, and other movements as well. So there is a degree of embodiment. There is a degree of mirroring. There is a degree of what we call isomorphism between the human body and the divine body of the cosmos. And so, uh, Zenya, I, I, I'm not referring to your model, your uh, piece on the 12 apostles, which I had the privilege of viewing uh, privately, but Zenya is also very much all about full embodiment, uh, very boldly uh, in, in many cases. And that's also sort of an element that's uh, part, of, part of this long history of um, the divine body in Kabbalah. Well, that's a tough act to follow. Uh, <laughs> you know, my, my observations as, as a, someone who has watched people watching art, looking at art, has always been something of a, of a bit of, of fascination because, uh, as many of you know, people walk by a painting. Uh, Zhenya approaches portraiture in a rather brave way. Um, she's not flattering her uh, subjects in this kind of shiny Renaissance polished manner. And I think that that's part of what I was saying earlier about the liberation that the camera afforded artists to, to seek outward. But the notions of beauty is also something that has been a very a uh, powerful sort of subject that has um, made me consider things. We're all seduced 
by beauty. But what is beauty, in fact? And there is a remarkable uh, exhibition that I did many years ago, uh, some years ago, of an artist, Patrick Graham, of Irish, uh, very powerful, poignant artist. And he related a story to me, which I think is something really valuable for all of us to consider. He went to visit his sister who was dying in the hospital was told she had some months to live and had gone through treatments and had lost her hair and and was uh, in that room with her husband and Patrick and in a moment of remarkable a remarkable moment she says to her husband have I lost my beauty if one is to have the physical attributes of a you know, great Ang model, the nude model that's so classical and so forth. That's a very short period of time in our lives. So what is beauty and how do we interpret it, consider it, how do we sustain it in our lives? And I think artists teach us that to a great deal. And I think what Zhenya is doing here follows in a tradition of a great number of artists um, who have addressed it in a very honest way, not superficially in this polished manner, but something that is lasting and an inner beauty. And I think that's a very important thing to consider in our lives and how we judge people and ourselves and others, and certainly in terms of a great work of art, which is in and of itself somehow a provocative thing to engage a work of art. It moves us off of our moment of comfort. It allows us to consider. A great work of art is not reflective, it's evocative. And that, I think, is the quality that one should search for in these kinds of works. This is so powerful, and it, it makes me think of something very profound and a joke. But I'll start with a profound. Oh, darn. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to endure. So I flash back to the painting that's also in this room that I hope that you can go up closely. These paintings are, by the way, meant to be seen from really far away, and not only up close, but to be experienced at every step. And as every step that you take, they're hopefully going to tell you something a little bit different. Um, and by the time you get closer, um, it's a much more abstract and much more emotive experience. When you back away, there's more of an image and narrative. So here, in this painting of the narrative that you see here, is my seven-year-old daughter visiting my 97-year-old grandmother. And in my experience growing up and being a human being, children are sort of fearful of older people. They almost see it as something a little bit dirty or something something to stay away from. To kiss a grand like a great great grandma is is something there's something like almost like a kiss of death. You're afraid that it's gonna rub off and you're gonna get old and wrinkly. And what was so amazing to me is to see the love between the two of them. Uh, Nika, my daughter, was my grandmother's I, I'm named after my grandmother Zhenya, my grand Baba Zhenya. Uh, her first, her last love, Nika was her last love, and Nika, my grandma, was one of her first loves. And she would visit my grandma, and what was so amazing is Nika actually was born and she was learning to talk and to walk and to do her feats. My grandmother was forgetting them. As Nika was starting to walk, my grandmother was limiting her walking. As Nika was talking, my grandmother was stopping to talk. And there was this amazing passage between the two of them, amazing trust and love. And here in this painting, you can actually see where um, the composition is such that there's a cyclical energy that's being passed down, and Nika's hand is becoming the older woman's hand. You could see that in the painting. It's hard to tell who's who. Uh, the, my grandmother is wrapped almost like a mommy or almost like a baby uh, when they're swaddled and she's limited in her ability and my, my daughter is coming from above looking at it. And I witnessed all these moments and I wanted to share them. And so this, this moment, to me, this was a moment of beauty. Uh, there's another painting next to it. Uh, this is called The Secret. And there is a secretive aspect in uh, a lot of mystical teaching. And there's a secretive aspect in passing down the knowledge of the Kabbalah. And I like this poetic um, 
license here in this painting that I witnessed my daughter whispering something to my grandmother and my grandmother receiving this knowledge, but I don't know what she had said. All I witnessed is this exchange and that's what I wanted to paint for you. I actually painting in this moment, um, in this painting, something I do not know, something I felt that was deep and important. And perhaps if you listen close enough, you will hear the whisper and then you can tell me what it was. Um, the joke that I wanted to tell is, um, I made a series of paintings when I was in my graduate school, graduate study, of all of the visiting professors. The visited professors were paid by the hour, and I, and I would sign up for two or three hours, so they got paid a lot, they just loved me. And I would say, you don't have to say anything, you could just sit and relax and I'll paint you. So I made a series of all these famous artists, and one of them was Jim Hayward, who is a great uh, local Los Angeles painter. and. Um, I met him a few years later, and he's really funny. You should hear it, like how he says it. Um, I won't even try, but I'll, the, the contest was such. He said, Genia, I never understood, and this is goes back to what you said, why you don't flatter us. I mean, portraiture is supposed to flatter, and you make us all look 10 years older. Now, what's the deal with that? Why are you doing this? And he said, now that it's been 10 years, you're flattering us. So he says, I get it. <laughs> the portrait you know, becomes younger as we become older. So that's, that's an interesting element of time in portraiture as well. Um, I wanted to flash perhaps to the most symbolic painting, clearly symbolic, that is not in the exhibition. Um, the reason that it's not in the exhibition, it's actually at the Jerusalem Biennale right now as we speak. Um, and it was made to go to that exhibition. And the task that we were asked by the curator was to reflect about our identity uh, and about our history. And here you recognize the symbol in the middle, I'm looking through the Star of David. Um, the Star of David um, is a very important um, symbol and in, in, in it's not just restricted to Judaism. But I wanted to tell you a slightly personal story, perhaps then jump to Pinus and his thoughts about this. Uh, but this personal story is that when I was probably 19 years old, I met an incredible artist who was in his 80s. So to me, he, he was ancient at the time. And his name was David Sieg Siegel. Did you know David by any chance? He, he remarkable, he studied with a bow house in, in, in Chicago. He was a remarkable sculptor. And he called me, he gave me a nickname, he called me a tiger. He never called me Genia, he always said, go get them, tiger. And he had lots of ideas for me. Uh, he didn't have children or grandchildren. Him and his wife decided that he will dedicate his life to art. The child will be his art. And so he kind of adopted me both as his child and his grandchild. And he took this paper and he took sponges and he sponged and kind of created this abstract ba backgrounds on this paper, about 10 sheets. And he said, Genia, I, I created this uh, for you to experiment, and I think you should paint the Ten Commandments. I think you should go to the Bible and you should go read and create this modern narrative. And this paper said in my studio, he passed away and it was still there. But when I was asked to do this piece, um, there was a certain dimension, and it was a small dimension, my paintings are so large. And this dimension of the required piece was exactly to the paper he had prepared for me. So I pulled it out, so before even the image was made. Um, and the Star of David, his name is David Siegel, is him. Here to me has another dimension. I'm looking through a personal touch, an artist who inspired me and is my guardian angel. So I want to jump to Pinhas. Well, it's interesting. The Star of David is um, <clears throat> really only about the last 400 years. Well, that's fairly recent when you're thinking about Jewish things. Um, <clears throat> around the last 400 years. Of course, the symbol has been around for a long time, but it really symbolized God's descent into the world and the acolytes' ascent towards God, that God comes into the world and extends everywhere, and the acolyte has to rise up uh, uh, and, and, and sort of in the classic, the classic pose of the hands, um, you know, raised even from the temple goddesses in Crete, we know this this posture, uh, or you may even do it in certain yoga asanas. Um, uh, 
the acolyte below and, and God above, and they cross, and in that shared space is really, that's the inner meaning of the, of, uh, the concept, even though it's, it's become a bit um, uh, controversial now uh, because of uh, um, politics and that kind of thing. So that's where it is, and it's interesting that the eyes are in that moment the highest of the earthly. Um, you know, that's where the eyes are in this portrait. Uh, and the mouth is is what's sort of the uh, the beginning, mm -hmm. so that's sort of interesting to me. I can't comment on the specific painting, but I, there is something that, uh, um, as this conversation of faith um, is discussed, for me every painting. A genuine artist, every stroke is an act of faith. And there's alchemy in it. Uh, we're not talking about facility, but in this kind of work, when you approach the painting very close up, you will see things that don't really make sense in a sense, uh, in that you have to step away to see what that mark will make. And that's part of the magic in, in appreciating a painting. And, and we all move too quickly. And painting is a slow process of absorbing, like a great piece of music. And I always say, if you get kind of tired of hearing this great symphony that you love so much, and you, you, you can't see it every day. I mean, you can't hear it every day. Same thing with a painting, you have to be prepared to accept it and it's as much about what you bring to it as what it gives you but if you quit listening or looking in the case of the symphony enter it from a different way search for the piccolo <laughs> you'll hear the piece of music in a completely profoundly different way and what I've observed certainly in my own looking we enter a painting the same way all of the time. Mm -hmm. You know that billboard, the Batman um, uh, billboard, where the you know the the mask was there. Um, I never saw it that way. I saw it as like teeth and like almost a rabbit. It's like if you know the artist Vasarelli, who did the convex concave thing. Some of us enter convexly, and others con quite the reverse, and. Some of us key upon the light. Some of us enter a painting from the dark tone. Force yourself to see it another way. These things have a living experience. And you know, you can't be brought to your knees every time you pass by your favorite painting. But sometimes you have to step back, see these things for the magnificence that they can be, the alchemy of what is nothing more than a collage of marks. That's it. If I can piggyback right on that, um, this idea of perception and looking is perhaps one of the most important subjects in arts itself. And there becomes a kind of an interesting mirroring because you are watching a work of art, but a work of art can also watch you or the subject of the painting or work of art can be that of observation. Um, not too different from the modern advances in quantum physics of observer and being observed. Um, on that wall, I don't have the slides, but if you turn to your right, um, you will see two paintings that are flanking my teacher, and they're very much about what Jack had said. It's about looking at the world, which is looking at the world is like looking at the painting. And the first one is of my daughter, Nika. And for those of you, which is everybody who has been around a child in one capacity or another, you'll notice how much they like to stare. And there's a moment in the child's development when they can hold up their neck. So they start to really stare at the world. But because before, they were really horizontal. And it's the first time that they're seeing the world upright. And the negative space here, that's actually the gray part that's unpainted. But this is the boundary. This is the shoulder of Nika's father, my husband, Evan. And it's unpainted because this world is new to her. She's everything be be behind the shoulder she has not seen yet. 
right? So this is all to form. And in a way, um, here it's, it's very much the painting about negative space and positive space. You might think of it as unfinished, but actually that, that is the painted shoulder in a way. That, that is which is not, not painted. That same curiosity of her gazing outward and seeing and taking in and trying to describe, she's painting you in her eyes. She's looking at you, looking at her, and making opinion for the first time. As you go to the right, jumping over my teacher, uh, there's a painting of my grandmother. And this is the time uh, where my grandmother stopped speaking and stopped recognizing. She wouldn't even respond to her family. We would walk into the room, and she wouldn't know that we were there. And yet she was very much alive, very much present. And what I noticed that she was looking and this was not the empty stare. She was looking somewhere we, to where I had no access. I had no means of asking her, and I could see that she was seeing what I'm not seeing. And so this is a kind of a double, the beginning and the end, of looking into the world from two perspectives, from two vantage points, um, that I wanted to kind of respond to this idea of painting and looking. I also wanted to flash to you um, let's see which way I'm going. What's ahead? Oops, did I jump too far? Slideshow. Start, okay. I'm doing something wrong. I have an observation, yes. a question oh, while, okay. while you're searching. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, many years ago I did a, an exhibition of the great American modernist Max Weber, and most of it came from a woman's collection who was a student of his. And she said, you know, I did a sculpture of Max Weber, and I wonder if you would include it in the exhibition. And I said, well, sure. You know, I hadn't seen that sculpture. Um, she brought it. And this sculpture looked nothing like Max Weber, but it looked like her. <laughs> and it's really a question that I have. Part of the question for you is, I think artists do um, project their own concerns through their models, those that take the liberties, not merely doing effigies. But what I observe in all of your paintings is a certain vulnerability of your subjects. There's a wistfulness, one of those looking back and being considering where they considering where they had been. And even in the child, there is a kind of projection of vulnerability of what might yet lay before this child. There's this, there's an expression in that. And so I guess my question for you, Genia, is is this a reflection in terms of your own concerns? She's obviously a very thoughtful artist, as we see and hear. And um, I'm wondering as to what level of your own projections that you empathize with these This people. is a fantastic question. And I want to quote um, my muse and my model, who's sitting here, Mark Snyder. Mark, can you wave? <laughs> I have worked with Mark for almost 20 years, and uh, there's actually a documentary, if you'd like to see, that's called um, The Models Artist, because you all know that we refer to models as artist models. So this is not an artist model, this is the models artist, because in a way I'm catering to him and he's not catering to me. And uh, I'd like to quote him because he, says, he said uh, something that really struck me. Uh, in to answer your question. He says, there's a kind of us-ness to what we do. So it's not him, it's not the model, it's not me, it's a kind of us-ness. And when we come together, it's us. But what's so amazing is that this does not endure because the model goes home and the artist goes home. The painting goes out to the viewer and meets the viewer and neither the model nor the artist are there. And then there is an us-ness between the viewer and the painting. That's the next set of relationship. And here the portrait or self-portrait comes from the viewer. You are active participant. Perhaps I should go back to the root of the word art itself, which really struck me. It comes from the word 
are being. It's being. Art is what makes us alive. Without art, we're dead. So if anybody ever asks you for the value, why should we have art? It's because that's the only thing that proves that we are alive. Um, and this se sense of being in the moment, so when you come to the painting, it is your story. It's no longer my grandmother, it is your grandmother, right? It's no longer my child, it is your child. I had an amazing story when I walked into this room at the opening. Let's see if I mess this up or if I can go back. And this painting, um, that's in this gallery. There was a man that greeted me in this room at the exhibition. He was one of the first to arrive here. He was in tears over this painting. And he said that this is so much his daughter. And I hope it's OK I share his story. Um, this is so much my daughter. I cannot believe that you painted someone that looks like my daughter. I have not spoken to her in 20 years. I had a painful divorce. And and you know she thinks bad things about me, which are probably not true. but. Um, I have not spoken to her, I've been afraid, but after seeing this painting, I'm going to try to make another effort, yet one more effort to reach out to her. So this, this was about him. This was about his story, and it actually had an impact in his life. That's probably one of my most um, amazing stories to me personally, how the painting can affect someone. I wanted to show you something that's also ahead. This is not in the exhibition. I almost put it in the exhibition, but I didn't because this is a marker of a new series that I'm doing. And this is to go back to Pinhas and what he was saying. Uh, this series is called As Above, So Below. And it's this relationship between uh, the spiritual, spiritual divine God and the human being. Um, there is a tradition in, in Western um, thought that occurs during Renaissance. It's actually um, coincides with the Rosicrucianism, um, as Manly P. Hall's grandmother was inspiring him, where the Rosicrucianists believe that one should not go to the temple or the church, but one should not even look for God above. But if one was to f search for God, all they had to do is look inside. And if you could know, know this expression of know thyself, the reason you want to study yourself is because you're actually studying the divine. And um, the play here is not only this idea of the relationship and how you find the relationship to the divine source, but also the vantage points. All of these paintings are from critical view vantage points of either looking from above or really from below. And so the perspective in the body really changes. How we look at the body changes. And I'm giving you a little bit of a preview of one of the new paintings in this series. And I wonder if Pinhas has any thoughts about that. Well, I'm just thinking about the head, that the, 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 the skull itself, the word in Kabbalah is the Aramaic word gol, Golgotha, which means, uh, is the same word from Christianity as Golgotha, the hill of the skull. And we have a, a, a tremendous you know, sense of the, the, the raw nature of the, of the skull and the chambers of the brain, as we had in the reading just now. Um, uh, the, the left hand side being intuition and the right hand side being um, uh, uh, sort of uh, knowledge, the repository of knowledge. And um, always this, this sort of work to qualify um, a strong tradition of the third eye, which is the mystical or Kabbalistic understanding of what the phylacteries, the tefillin, if you've seen people wearing them, they're really uh, against the third eye or to, to express the third eye. Um, so we have this on, you know, in mind constantly in Jewish mysticism. Um, I think as we come up to the end of our hour, perhaps each one of us has a l little message, something that we want to share, last thoughts, um, and then we'll stay if you have any questions, um, either perhaps even off stage. But I'd like to turn to Jack if you want to share something about even your life, if you like. <laughs> uh, it's too long a story. Uh, but I, I, you touched on something that uh, touches me, this, this healing impact that art can have. Um, as a gallerist that was very much present in my gallery for exhibitions, I, I observed rare but not infrequent, really, occasions where people's lives were actually changed. 
And I would like to share one story, if I may. It's, it's, I'll try not to make it long. I'll cut it down. Um, there was a, there's an artist that I uh, represent by the name of Jerome Whitkin, who is some would regard with the most extraordinary narrative painter of today. Um, he did a series that is Im impossible to convey and on the Holocaust. It's a subject that is dealt best in the abstract because how do you convey the undescribable? And we did an exhibition of some of his Holocaust paintings, some of which are as big as this entire wall, some of them are more modest in scale. But there was a woman that came into my gallery and sat in the back room waiting for her friend. And I knew her friend, is a buddy of mine, and he was very late. And I finally went down to speak to her, thinking I'll stall for him. And I gestured to one of the paintings, and it was not a grotesque painting, but a powerful one. She says, I can't look at this. She says, I knew Hitler, and I cannot look at this. She meant that in the, she was obviously a child, uh, a young girl that had been in the camps and so forth. She says, I cannot look at this. And she says, I can't look at any of these. She was facing away from these paintings. The front of the gallery had other paintings, but the back gallery, which was about this side, had only the Holocaust paintings. Anyway, she left, my friend came, and she wrote me a note. Uh, perhaps you remember me. I was in the other day, I'm Jim's friend. How could I forget? I, I mean, I didn't tell you the drama that, that, that I experienced there. And she said, I went home and for the first time in my life, I am a whole person. Because in the course of our time, I gestured to something that was accessible and it gave her entree to something that gave witness to her experience that she had carried her entire life. And she wrote me this letter saying that for the first time, I am a whole person and a weight has been lifted from me. This is just one of several stories that I've had over many stories actually, but most dramatic, there were others. But I want to at least convey to you that art is a place for entertainment, for poignancy, for something so moving. And today in our pop culture mentality, where art too often uh, echoes our broader society, well look around you folks, um, <laughs> There is a place and a great need for artists and art of conviction, and uh, it's just great to be able to engage it on a nearly daily basis, and I encourage you all to not just look for decoration, but really engage the works of art that you encounter. This is so powerful. Thank you. And uh, I encourage all of you to go on Jack's website and look at what he's done. I simply have to pinch myself and make sure I'm not sleeping and dreaming that I'm actually sitting on the same stage with him and that he's uh, talking about um, my art in this context. So thank you. I want to take a moment to really acknowledge how much this means to me, You're truly, truly. And uh, Pinhas, is there a thought that you want? Well, I just some other time we should really talk about eyes and the paradox of eyes that, you know, we have these bodies and our bodies are, when we're young, we think we can do anything with our bodies. We can abuse them or we can build them up or we can stretch them or do whatever we can. But, but the eyes sit like pools in the midst of this, of this body in this, in this, um, just, uh, uh, we use them and yet we're not sort of in control of the way that they are and, and the emphasis on eyes here uh, uh, that the word for I in the original hieroglyph that the Hebrew letter that means I, I in, came from it was a spring. So originally it was a spring and the Song of Songs says your eyes are springs and the way <clears throat> the eyes in all your work exist sort of semi-independently and I also think there's something in the relationship of your daughter and your grandmother uh, that one that uh, when the child sees their grandparent, they don't see the crone that they are. They see only the spiritual 
aspect of them and it's the first relationship where they've gone beyond um, the physical in that regard. So sometime I'd like to talk about eyes with you. And I don't know if you guys know, but there was somebody who was watching you the whole time while your back is to them. There's one eye that's intently staring to you. <laughs> um, also, if you're wondering, um, talking about the embodiment of God, what God looks um, in Gershman world, um, it's actually Mark's hands. So if you, Mark, can you hold up your hands, Lisa? <laughs> God's hands to me. This is a monumental painting. It's not in this exhibition, but it's in the cover of the catalog. It's almost the size of this wall, and it's called Lift. So talking about what, what you mentioned, the, the uplifting. When, when you stand in front of it, it almost feels like it's lifting you up in the air, and you're losing the sense of gravity. Um, and I'm hoping that the art would, would have something like that for you. Um, as we come towards the end, and we can take maybe, would you like to take a couple of minutes of questions? Would you, would you guys like to stay a couple of minutes if you have some questions? But perhaps one last thing that I wanted to officially share with you. Um, I'm sitting here again with such great scholars. And why, one would want to maybe quote a great thinker, philosopher, like Manly Behol or Torah the Old Testament, but I will actually quote an eraser. This is a quote that's, uh, the price is 695. And this eraser really spoke to me. I saw it at the Getty and I had to buy it. And you can see that it's still wrapped. This is my holy grail. I will not use it. And I show it to every one of my students. I have founded an academy. It's called Ziard Academy. And every entering student has to hold this eraser. This is our Bible. And it says, where the spirit does not work with the hand, there is no art. Leonardo da Vinci. Wow. So if you want to touch this before you leave, this is my magical <laughs> talisman here. So I want to officially thank everybody and thank our panelists for being here. So thank you so much.